We hear the word inflammation a lot, but do we truly understand the impact of inflammation and know if it's silently or overtly affecting our health? From heart disease to depression to even autoimmune disease, it's kind of the key driver behind almost every illness that we can have, but it's also a master of disguise. The thing is, inflammation is a vital, important defense mechanism, but when it becomes chronic and out of control, it can be destructive. And so today we're going to explore some of the science behind inflammation and its link to chronic disease states, but also in the various ways that it can manifest both in obvious and not so obvious symptoms and signs like blood markers. Hello and welcome. My name is Dr. Taranella and this channel is dedicated to helping you optimize and improve your health. Today, we're taking a deep dive into the world of inflammation. If you're finding this information useful and helpful, click on that like and subscribe to continue getting videos like this one. Yes, inflammation is your body's response to injury, infections, and it's a complex complex process involving a lot of immune cells, blood vessels, different signaling molecules coming from different areas. And the idea is that it's eliminating threats or minimizing the threats and also helping your body repair the damage that has come in from those threats. Acute inflammation is short term and focused on local areas. Chronic inflammation, however, is often more persistent and at a much lower level or lower grade. And this persistence over time can lead to ongoing tissue damage and ongoing going problems in your organs and tissues. Basically name any chronic health issue and at the heart of that is going to be some inflammation, some chronic smoldering inflammatory process. So like cardiovascular disease, there's atherosclerosis is fundamentally inflammation plus cholesterol and that's going to cause a buildup of plaque in the arteries. With type 2 diabetes, there's damage to the insulin receptors or interference with the natural signaling of insulin, basically making it harder for the glucose to get into the cells. And this then can also damage the insulin producing cells. So you have a double whammy. Neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, MS are definitely linked to neuroinflammation, meaning increased inflammation in your brain from the immune cells. Autoimmune disease like rheumatoid arthritis, lupus are fundamentally immune dysregulation or autoimmune diseases. Cancer often comes about from increased cell turnover over time. This chronic inflammation and different tissues can lead to a mistake in that DNA, which then leads to unchecked cell division and tumor growth. Mental health problems like anxiety and depression, there's also growing evidence to support the fact that these are inflammatory processes as well. And so you can think of inflammation as like a fire, that's the common analogy, but acute inflammation is more like a controlled fire. And so you remove the unwanted debris or underbrush and the new tissue can come in, the new forest and growth can start to flourish and you have all fresh new growth. Chronic inflammation, on the other hand, is more like a smoldering wildfire that slowly consumes everything in its path. And that persistence of the fire, that smoldering, doesn't allow new tissue to renew itself, to come in and replace that old debris field. And so the common mistake is that basically people are unaware that this chronic inflammation is there. And when there is a problem there that they're aware of, like say they're tired or they have digestive of issues. They attribute it to other causes or overlook it entirely. And so the main obstacle here is that chronic inflammation goes on silently in the background because there's not really acute, obvious symptoms. The symptoms and problems with these chronic inflammatory states come on slowly and they kind of smolder for years. And even in some cases, when you do get blood tests done, the blood tests may show up as, well, things look normal. And that's because there's not a systemic global inflammation. It's localized in a specific area. So markers like C-reactive protein or set rate or others may not even show up, even though in some cases you have significant joint pain, significant damage going on in certain tissues, you can still have normal CRP, normal set rate and other markers. The opposite is also true. You may not have a specific joint that's inflamed or specific problem that you are noticing, but then when you check your labs, well, there you have much higher CRP than the normal or higher set rate. And so this mismatch or or disconnect, if you will, can make it a little bit challenging for patients and clinicians alike to figure out what's causing that and then address that problem. And so let's look at how inflammation contributes to disease states a little bit more in depth and how I can tell if I have that and what I can do about it if it's there. So inflammation is basically immune activity. And so if you have chronic inflammation, you have chronic immune cells that are constantly activated and they're releasing inflammatory molecules. So they're recruiting more immune cells to that area like 
like TNF alpha, interleukin six, and these chemicals are going to bring more immune cells to the area, which are then going to produce the same chemicals. And so it just perpetuates the cycle. When those cells arrive on the scene, that they're going to try to wall off and protect that area. And in doing so, they're going to actually damage the tissue, create oxidative stress, which is going to damage the cell membranes, damage DNA. Those cells are then going to open up, which creates another signal for more immune cells to come to the area. And so you're stuck in this persistent loop of inflammation, causing more damage, causing more inflammation, causing more white blood cells to come to the area. And naturally we have processes in our body that are built into stop that inflammatory process. And so what we're talking about here is when there's a problem with that natural process being stopped, either it's been burnt out and the inflammation has just kept going over years, or there's an issue with the down regulation of the inflammation. Sometimes it's just that the trigger is persistently there causing the inflammation. Sometimes your body isn't naturally producing that down regulatory response. Some common causes of chronic inflammation is really oftentimes a combination of many of the following problems. And finding the exact one cause can sometimes be tricky. And that's because oftentimes there's multiple things, multiple layers playing a role. So let's give you some specific examples to help you get a better grasp on this. So diet sometimes can be either overlooked or overemphasized. That is to say that you need to have a base level of good diet in order to have minimal inflammation. And so if you're eating a lot of highly processed food, refined carbohydrates and sugars, healthy fats like trans fats in excessive amounts of omega-6, all these things are going to enhance the amount of inflammation in your body. And specifically looking at fats, fats can basically turn up the inflammatory process or turn down the inflammatory process, depending on which kind you have. So if you, when you have excessive trans fats, you're going to be turning up the inflammatory process. Omega-3s up to a certain extent are going to turn that down, but you need a certain balance and ratio of these two. Excessively high carbohydrate levels can also turn up the inflammatory dial as well, because the high blood sugar is going to start to damage damage those tissues and create more inflammation. Another common area to look when we're looking at sources of inflammation in the body is your gut health, digestive health. So there's something known as dysbiosis, and this is when there's an imbalance in the good bacteria and the bad bacteria. Sometimes dietary factors can play a really big role in this, and when that imbalance is there, especially when it's severe, it can lead to increased inflammation in the intestines, and that inflammation can allow for the gap junctions to open up. Say this is your intestine intestines and food particles and even bacteria can start to seep into the body where this is the body and things are starting to seep through and even get into the bloodstream. And that's kind of an example of a mild kind of chronic infection, but other chronic infections, sometimes people have ongoing sinusitis, ongoing sinus infections that come on every two, three months. Whether you have an infection coming from your gut or your intestines, these chronic infections are going to your cortisol levels, which are then going to increase your blood sugar, which is going to then also increase your inflammation systemically and locally. And so now you have two things that are causing inflammation in your body. And so you can see how these things start to snowball in the wrong direction. Pollutants from the environment or sometimes living in a moldy house or heavy metals, all these things can lead to abnormal fat accumulation, insulin resistance, and even in some cases, fatty liver can then cause more problems with processing carbohydrates and processing other macronutrients, which can then lead to insulin resistance, which can also create more inflammation. Stress levels, maybe you have a really stressful job and prolonged high cortisol levels can deplete or suppress the immune activity, which can allow you to have more infections. When you get infection, that's going to stimulate more immune activity and it may go on chronically because that stress level is so high. So you can see that these are kind of vicious cycles. One problem leads into another oftentimes. And so when you find yourself in this situation, you kind of have to start to deconstruct some of these things the best you can. But it is tricky sometimes figuring out where do we actually start. And we start by basically trying to find the best entry point we can, which comes from blood testing and looking at your overall patterns of symptoms. And so symptom-wise, chronic inflammation is a lot of times silent, but that doesn't mean there's not symptoms underneath that silence, meaning you may not have pain in your knee, but you have persistent fatigue. You have maybe joint pain off and on or stiffness off and on. Maybe you have digestive issues or skin rashes or hives. Maybe you have brain fog or problems concentrating or again, depression, anxiety issues. These are all indicators of inflammation because again, fundamentally at the heart of most disease states is an inflammatory process. And so we can look 
to blood tests as well that can help us really understand, give us an objective measurement to follow. And these can be really helpful. Things like C-reactive protein or erythrocyte sedimentation rate. But it's important to note that even if these numbers are normal, it doesn't mean you don't have any inflammation. We all have some inflammation, but it's really about do you have enough there that's going to cause issues. If you don't have any health issues and your blood tests show that it's normal, there's really nothing to worry about. But if you do have health issues, your blood test says it's normal, there may still be an issue there. Other potential blood tests, depending on symptoms, that could give us more clues is your CBC. It can show elevations in white blood cells. So you can have a maybe a normal CRP or slightly elevated CRP, but your white blood cells are off the chart. That's a really unusual thing to see. In addition, specific types of white blood cells can give you clues about what's going on when they're persistent. So eosinophils, for instance, are going to be high when you have more things going on with the histamine producing cells or allergies. And neutrophils are going to be more commonly high when you have infections, specifically bacterial infections, but it really can be any kind of infection. Ferritin levels, when those are elevated, that can be an indication of iron overload, of course, but it can also be an indication of some kind of chronic inflammation going on in your body. And then there's also autoimmune markers like anti-nuclear antibodies, rheumatoid factor, and specific anti-nuclear antibodies that you can look at to identify what tissues are involved with the autoimmune process that do have that going on. And so as you can see, there's a complex interplay between localized tissue inflammation and systemic inflammation. And understanding that is crucial to getting to the root cause of what's causing yours. You can have significant inflammation in your joints causing pain and swelling without any actual rise in your CRP. And on the flip side, you can have really high CRP and your joints feel fine. Maybe you have just a generalized fatigue or something like that, but there's no obvious joint issues. And so that's why you need to layer on your symptoms with the lab test results to kind of get a better understanding of those connections. So if you do have these problems or suspect that you do, let's take a look at how to go about reducing some of this chronic inflammation when it is present or you suspect that it's present. So once you suspect that this is going on or you find that this is going on, the most important thing is to find the cause. And it typically means you're going to use some specific tests or specialty lab tests to uncover or identify what the cause is. Sometimes you can also use various forms of treatment trials or experiments to understand what the cause is. But sometimes those searches may come up empty handed. That doesn't mean you stop looking. So here's some more ideas, some general diet strategies for reducing inflammation. Foods can often trigger inflammation for a lot of different reasons. And generally speaking, a whole foods diet with less processed foods, lots of fruits and vegetables, fatty fish that's abundant in omega-3s, that's going to be a good healthy diet to follow. And even adding in some extra omega-3s is going to cause your body to produce more anti-inflammatory molecules and set you up a little bit better to reduce the overall inflammation in your body. Whereas foods that are higher in saturated fat or refined sugar are going to directly increase the immune activity in your body and promote inflammation. So it could be just as simple as adding a little omega-3s to your diet as a starting point. You can also take this a little bit further and try to refine and optimize your diet. And let's face it, we can pretty much come up with something wrong with every food. The objective is to find what's wrong with your specific foods that you're eating for your body. And so we can do things like the AIP diet or elimination diet. And this is a good way to find out which foods are potentially causing you more issues and that you might want to remove from your diet. So the general idea is that you avoid these foods for somewhere around three to six weeks. And then you challenge the foods to try and see if some of that inflammation or problems come back. And you can also look at your labs before and after the challenge, a low FODMAP diet. Well, same kind of thing here where you eliminate and challenge to see what kind of symptoms symptoms are occurring when you go through that process. Gut health optimization is a big one for inflammation and joint pain and various problems that people run into. And sometimes we'll just start taking prebiotics and probiotics and they can be really helpful, but more often than not, the issue is with uh, some kind of bacterial overgrowth or imbalance in your microbiome, specifically in the small intestine. And these kinds of imbalances are going to cause a gut derived inflammation, similar to how we said earlier that the microbes are going to seep through. Well, also you can have some white blood cell activity through that the intestines as well that's going to ramp up then the systemic inflammation as well. And we can do tests like SIBO tests or stool tests to uncover these problems and even look for inflammation in those stool tests too. You can do similar things to look at your stress management and sleep hygiene. Of course, getting enough sleep is important for the stress cortisol response, which can then again suppress the immune activity and create inflammation that way. And regular exercise, of course, starting with light, gentle exercise exercise, gradually increasing the amount of pressure on your joints and muscle tissue can be really helpful at creating an overall anti-inflammatory
inflammatory effect in your body. Yes, you may get a little bit of increased inflammation at first, but it should go down over time. But it's important to make sure you're not overdoing it with exercise, especially if you're having a lot of pain. And then, of course, there are specific supplements that you may find useful in some cases. But again, it's really important to try and find what the cause is. And when this becomes challenging, or maybe you just want to try something because you're in a lot of pain or discomfort, some of these supplements can be helpful. So we mentioned omega-3s and those are definitely going to be useful. There's also some turmeric or curcumin products. There's certain ones that are going to be more highly absorbable in your body. So I like the QAnol form because it's micronized and also like the liposomal form by Thorn because it's more readily absorbable. Vitamin D is also a decent play here because a lot of times people are deficient in vitamin D and it plays a big role in immune regulation and through that can have a anti-inflammatory effect. You have to be really careful not to get too much vitamin D because it can accumulate in your body and then you can become toxic. So if you want to learn more about inflammation and various things in the body that may promote that and ways you can deal with it, check out our playlist on inflammation to get more detailed info. Remember, chronic inflammation underlies almost every negative physiological process and disease in our body. A lot of times it's silent, but it still can be damaging our tissues underlying that very subtly over time, even if there's no obvious symptoms. Some common causes for this chronic inflammation are chronic infections, dietary problems, not enough exercise, not enough sleep, too much stress, digestive problems like gut dysbiosis, and the list kind of goes on and on. Measuring and understanding your inflammation can be tricky because sometimes it's not going to show up on the test, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't at least check to see if it's high. And then when it's high, you want to take action to try and lower that inflammation. We can do this with certain lifestyles, like making sure we're eating the optimized diet, getting regular exercise, getting plenty of sleep, optimizing our gut health, and even sometimes taking supplements. So these are some general ideas around inflammation that may help you get some traction so that you can start to feel better and some momentum so that you can do the things that you need to do. That's all I had to cover on this topic on inflammation. If you do have any questions, please drop them in the comment section. If you want a more nuanced, customized answer, consider joining the membership program. We'll have more time and attention to dedicate to your question. Now, one question you might have after watching this video is, is there an at-home inflammation test? And you can find more information on that in this video right here. Thanks again for watching.